Right, well, thanks folks for coming along to this talk I'm going to do tonight. Uh, that's a wintry scene just to set the season. Um, it's about the Loch Bar Ring Dyke on the Isle of Mull. And you might think, well, what's so great about that? Well, you'll find all about it tonight. Um, the talk isn't terribly complex. Um, the subject matter could be quite uh, tricky to deal with, depending on how you approach it. I'm taking a very simple approach to it. Uh, lots of pretty pictures uh, to illustrate what I'm talking about. So it's, it's basically an introduction to it. It's, uh, it's one of the geological wonders of the world, I would think. I would say the Loch Bar Ring Dyke isn't just locally significant, it's globally significant. If you look at any textbooks on igneous petrology, any of the half decent uh, geology books on the subject, you'll find that the Loch Bar Ring Dyke keeps coming up again and again. So we're going to have a look at that tonight and we'll have a, a bit of a virtual field trip where we'll go out and actually look at it. Like I said, lots of pretty pictures. So uh, the topics for tonight are this. We'll have a quick look at Mull's geology. The igneous activity that took place during the Paleogene, which used to be called the Tertiary, um, about 60 million years ago. There's a thing called the Central Complex, which looks horribly complicated, but uh, we'll break it down. There are what are called three centres associated with that, three centres of igneous activity. And the one in particular we're going to look at is centre three, the very last one. That's where the Loch Bar Ring Dyke is located. And we'll look at the Loch Bar Ring Dyke in a bit of detail. So I always start with sources of information. These are some of the books that are available um, that are you really need to read if you want to get a handle on this. Um, for simple stuff, the SNH guide, Landscape Fashion by Geology, is really good. There's also Mull in the Making, which has been around for a while now. That's a very good overview of Mull's geology. Um, if you want to get, a, there's also this one, Mull, Ion and Adamark, and that's really the updated version of this one here. Um, and it's, it's good. It doesn't cover it in huge detail, but there's, there's, it's enough to get you going. Um, the main text, if you're interested in the detail, are the geological map, this one here, which lots of people have got as a sort of wall hanging as a picture on their wall because it looks so colourful. Um, there's the Paleogene Volcanic Districts. This is by uh, Emily and Bell. This is a great book. This, this is there's very, very good detail in this. It's fairly modern, excellent diagrams, some of which we'll be using tonight. There's the Mall Memoir. This is what the officers of the Geological Survey put together in the early part of the 20th century. They did this incredible document um, this massive tome, this is highly detailed. It's quite remarkable what these guys did. Uh, and it, yeah, it still stands up today, a lot of what's in here. There's also this little book, which was quite influential. It's called The Tertiary Ignis Geology of Isle of Mull. It's basically an excursion guide. This was put together in 1969. And at the moment, it's really still the only detailed excursion guide to the Isle of Mull. Uh, there's, there's definitely a need for one. And I know someone who's working on one, but uh, I don't know when that will appear. So these are the sort of main books available. There's also online resources that I'll mention. Um, the Mull Memoir of the Geological Survey is available online, as is the map. You can get these things online. So is the SNH booklet, that, uh, that little that landscape fashioned by geology. You can get that online, you can download it as a PDF. There's also a thing called the Geological Conservation Review Reports. These were reports that were done on certain uh, sites of interest, certain importance, by Emilius and Gilpari, they're very good. Um, and that's available online if you can find them. And there's lots of university web pages that cover the geology as well. That you can just a simple Google search will find them. You know? There's also some papers that have been published on the, the Loch Bar Ring Dyke. Now, a lot of these, they are highly technical, um, but the thing is there's not that many. There are only, a, I mean, I'll make these available to anybody that wants them later. There are lots of, a areas of mall that have been really well described and well detailed, but the, the Loch Bar Ring Dyke doesn't seem to have had an awful lot of attention, to be honest with you. That's some other ones that, um, that are a, that's, that's basically it as far as I could find. I mean, there may be more if someone wants to point me in that direction, but these are the ones that I could find using Google Scholar. Uh, so there's, there's not a lot actually been done on it. It's, it's probably worthy of a lot more research. So I'll have a quick look at most geology to begin with. It looks very complex when you look at the map. And we're going to be looking at one of the complex areas. But don't worry about that. 
we can break it down into easier chunks. But let's have a look at the maps first of all. First one is, for those that don't know where Mull is, this is it here, off the west coast of Scotland, nice and straightforward. It's part of what's called the British Paleogeoignius province, it used to be called tertiary. And this shows the various centres, Rum, Skies and Kilda, Mull, Arran, Northern Ireland, even Lundy Island and the, the Bristol Channel. These were all associated with a volcanic activity early in the beginning of the tertiary, about 60 million years ago. So these are, these are, this is where all the action was 60 million years ago. This is a simplified geological map of Mull, and it gives you an overview. What you've got, this green stuff is basalt lavas, which are, cover most of Mull, in fact. The yellow stuff is the underlying rock, and this brown stuff here, that you find around the edges. And this splodge in the middle is what's called the central complex. And it's, it's, I mean, it looks horribly complicated, but it's actually fairly straightforward in terms of what happened when. The green stuff on here is basalt. On the BGS map, they've used a pink coloration for the basalt lavas, which we'll see in just a little while. If we're looking at the age relations of some of this stuff, it's all, it all goes back to about, like I said, about 60 million years ago, and it's over a fairly short time period. I mean, that's like from about 60.61 to about 58 million years ago. You're, you're not talking about a, a long period of geological time. That's a great thing about geology. You can call it a couple of millions of years, just a short period of time. Um, but the, the basic thing that happened was you had all this lava poured out to begin with. That's what the pink stuff is. Then that complicated area in the middle of the map followed on from that. This black line represents what are called dikes, which happened all the way through the, uh, the igneous period. And it's the same sort of story for the other areas as well. It may have taken a bit longer in some places, but you've got the lavas to begin with and then the complicated stuff following on. So the dikes happened all the way through, all the way through the, uh, the period that was diking taking place. Um, then you got the lavas were the first major thing to get poured out, then the central complex, and as I said, it's similar for the other locations as well. This is the map. This is the thing that people have hanging on their wall as a, a wall decoration, and it looks ferociously complicated. As I said, the pink stuff is the lavas around the edges, uh, and you've got this brightly coloured stuff, which I've often joked looks like an explosion of a paint factory in the middle. And this is where all the interest, the really interesting stuff is happening. The Loch Bar Ring Dyke is round there. That's it there, that yellow band you can just see going around there. But we'll look at this in a bit more detail. There are three centres of igneous activity associated with this. And these are basically the focus of where the action was. Centre one, centre two and centre three. And over time, that centre, if you like, the focus for the volcanic activity associated with the centre moved in a northwesterly direction. And um, this line here is the line of the ring dike. It's a big fracture, which we'll look at in a bit more detail. Uh, centre three was the final one, located near the bottom of the end of Loch Ba. There were actually three centres, one in Glenmore, one on the mountain called Ben Cashkittle, and the other near Loch Ba. Now that, these centres, you know, they get highlighted in all sorts of books and documents and things, but they're, they're really just focal points of activity. If you go there on the ground, there's not a lot to see. That is what center one's focal point looks like today. You know, fairly typical of mull in the rain, not a lot to see. It's not as if there's a nice big circular depression or some sort of um, mark on the ground that makes it really obvious where you are. Like I said, these are, these are the focus of the, act, of the activity, of the igneous activity. Um, they don't, they don't actually manifest themselves as anything particularly obvious on the ground. This is the, uh, the map for Centre 3. Centre 3, you see, that was the centre of all the volcanic activity, and you've got the ring dike going around the edge here, forming quite a nice big thing. And that's from the, 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 the a BGS map, this thing here. Now, I said, if you went to that point at the end of Loch Bar, you wouldn't actually see very much probably just grass. <clears throat> now here's a classic map. This is the same thing, just outlining the line of the dike. And this is taken from the memoir of the Geological Survey by Edward Bailey and his troops, published in the 1920s. 
And there's Ben Cashkill there that I mentioned. And that's uh, Loch Ba running up there. Glen Forsa. So that's the shape of the thing that we're going to be looking at. So you might ask, what is a ring dike? Well, here's a definition that's come from a Wikipedia. Now I know Wikipedia is not something you should really rely on, but this this definition is actually quite quite good. It's the truth of igneous body. It's circular, oval, arcuate, and plan with so steep contacts, and they can you know there's it says here, the most common accepted method of ring dike formation is directly related to collapsed calderas. In other words, your volcano gets to a point where it actually collapses and it creates a circular fracture that molten material gets injected into. That's basically the story. You can say, well, how does a ring dike compare to ordinary dikes? Well, these things here, this is the map, the geological map of North Mull. has got lots of dikes running. That's what these things are. Dikes are normally linear features. Normally they're in, going sort of straight lines. They usually follow a trend. In Mull, the trend for most of the dikes is northwest, southeast. And you can see these. I mean, there's a famous one at Calgary, which I showed last, last week in my talk, um, which stands out like a wall of rock on the, on the shoreline. But uh, yeah, North Mull is absolutely covered in these things, all moving in the same, going the same sort of direction. Um, but a ring dike is a circular thing. And this is also from that Wikipedia article. It says the Loch Bar ring dike found in the Isle of Mull Scots as a classic example of a well-formed ring dike. That's what I was saying about this thing being important. It's, it really is of global significance, this thing. So what happened? Well, basically the volcano developed a circular fracture. The central block collapsed. Magma intruded up the circular fissure that's now preserved as a dike. It's not present all the way around. You won't find it everywhere, but um, the, the, the fault that the thing develops around is discernible. You can find that in various places. But the dike, the dike is uh, visible, uh, certainly in the, the northwest uh, part of the, the ring dike. It's really obvious. This is <clears throat> an illustration I found online showing you basically what's happened. Similar sort of thing. This, the central block of the volcano has collapsed. And then you get the molten material forced up into the circular fracture around the side. Now that's, that's fairly simplified in terms of what happened in Mull, but uh, that's the basic principle. The thing collapses, the volcano collapses, and you get this stuff coming up around the edges. Here's a diagram taken from that SNH booklet, and this shows the, the Mull volcano and you've got the collapse of the central bit, and you've got the ring dike coming up the side here. It's quite a nice little illustration of this. Again, it's oversimplified, but it's um, it's pretty good. It's worth getting a hold of that SNH uh, booklet, the PDF, because there's some, there's some really nice diagrams and it explains a lot of the geology really, really well. So that's what happens. It's basically a collapse of a volcano. Here's a, a fairly uh, good example of a modern collapsed volcano. It's Santorini. And it's, you, know, you see the circular shape of the thing. If you want one nearer home, there's this, Glencoe. Everything that you see in this picture here is part of the sunken block that collapsed in the, in the volcano that was in Glencoe. <clears throat> and this is it on the map. If you look at the geological map of Glencoe, you'll find there's this big circular fracture, well, sort of elliptical fracture around the edge, and there's molten material being pushed up forming this line of stuff, this red stuff, all the way around. So that's why that's why Glencoe is as dramatic as it is. It's, it's, a, it's a collapsed volcano, what you're looking at there. Now, this is something that was originally described as a ring dike. Uh, this thing is a famous image, this of Ardnamurkin seen from space as the satellite image uh, of Ardnamurkin centered on Achnaha. And you can see the, uh, the, the, the rock has a definite circular sort of elliptical pattern to it. And this, was, this is called, this gets referred to as the Great Eucrite, the type of rock that it's made of. And the, the ring structure is quite obvious. It was thought to be a ring dike, but recent research has shown that it's not actually a ring dike. It's what's called a lopolith, which is a good word, which is like a saucer-shaped intrusion. So what we're seeing is the edges of it. So it's not quite the same thing, but this, the circular uh, outline is really obvious. 
before we start looking at the thing properly, a couple of quotations that are um, quite interesting. These are from the memoir, and it says, it may safely be maintained that Mull includes the most complicated Ignis Centre as yet accorded detailed examination anywhere in the world. So that's, why the, that's what the original survey officers thought. And there's this great quote as well. The Loch Bar Ring Dyke is the most perfect example of a ring dyke known to science. Uh, it's, it's quite interesting use of terminology there to describe it as the most perfect, as if you get degrees of perfection. So they were obviously quite awestruck by the whole thing. Um, it describes what it's made of and gives us dimensions. But um, yeah, the most perfect example of a ring dyke known to science. And as I said, it still crops up in any scientific discussion, any paper, any booklet, any book that's dealing with uh, ring dykes. The, the Loch Bar ring dyke in Mull is always held up as one of the best examples of this sort of thing. So what I want to do is look at it in picture and discuss it, a, 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 what's actually in the pictures themselves. Let's, let's say the just the introduction out of the way. What I've got are some satellite images taken from Bing. Bing and Google both have satellite images that you can look at. But um, I think the Bing ones for this are actually better than Google's. We'll start near Loch Ba itself because that's the, that's the best location to see it. Go up onto the hill and look at it in detail. You can also find it on Bind the Loose in Glenforsa. It stands out quite well up there. And it's also, you can find it higher up in Glenforsa, but it's not nearly so easy to find. It's quite tricky to find, in fact. I was out looking for it on Saturday, so it's all quite, the pictures I've got are quite fresh. So this is the Bing image of what the Loch, the Loch Bar ring dike looks like from space. That's Loch Bar here. And you can see the, the fish farm that used to be there. And it's this white band of rock that runs across here. It's really distinct, really, really stands out. And uh, if you look at it, you'll notice that there's a very distinct line running across here. That's a deep chasm that we'll be talking about later. I'll show you some pictures of that. That's, uh, that's, that's an interesting feature that. There's also other ones cutting across here. And these are actually the lines of later dikes that cut across the ring dike. So that's, that's the ring dike coming around here. And it goes across the loch. On the other side of the loch, this is Loch Bar down here, and we're looking to the northeast now. It's not quite so obvious, but it forms this line of crags here, this bit here, and it goes across here. And it just passes by there, that little outcrop there. You can actually find it right there in contact. So on, like I said, on the other side of the loch, it's not quite so obvious. It's, um, you know, you can pick it up, it's at least enough to find on the ground, but uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't stand out as quite such a distinct feature. So the, I mentioned the Geologist Association guidebook called the Tertiary Geology of Isle of Mull. They've actually got an excursion to the Loch Bar ring dike in it. There's, a, there's actually a, a fairly detailed description of a, you know, where to go and look at stuff. Um, a lot of the, <coughs> the excursions in that book are kind of tricky to follow now because of forestry and changes to the landscape. It means that, you know, it's, it's quite hard to find things. But the, the Loch Bar ring dike excursion in that guide is actually quite a good one. You can follow it, you can just go exactly to all the places that they mention. It actually starts off just outside the area. And that's what I want to have a, a quick look at uh, before we get going. It's useful to see the contract, the contact between the lavas and the central complex. Now, I mentioned this earlier that the, most of the lavas were extruded first. There was a great big pile of lava built up. And then the central complex, all that brightly colored, tricky looking stuff was injected into it later. A, at this point, you can actually see, you can go from the lava to the central complex, and then you can go to the ring dike. This is the book that I was talking about. And this is the, the place where you can actually see it. This is the road from Salon out to the west. And it's a place called Alt Sherman. And what you've got are, you've got the basalt lavas, which is all this pink stuff here. And you've got this 
darker pink material, which is a rock called granophyre, which is a type of granite, and you can actually see the contact of the two. So the lavas here are the earlier rocks that uh, you know, were extruded, first of all, and this granophyre is part of the stuff that was intruded into it. So this came later. And you can actually, you know, when you go up here to the to where the old quarries were, you can actually see little fingers and veins of the granophyre intruding into the basalt. You can actually see that it cuts into the basalt. So that's, um, that's, that's quite a neat location. It's easy to get to and uh, quite straightforward to see what's going on there. Um, that green thing there is what is called a cone sheet. And that's right beside the road. Now, cone sheets, I'll be, I'll be talking about, I'm not going to discuss them tonight, but I'll be talking about them next week. But if you want to see a cone sheet, that's a great example of one. It's right beside the road. You, you can't miss it. So if we get going, go up the road to Knock. So there's a car park area. And uh, you just basically follow the track up the side of, uh, towards Loch Bar. And um, you're faced with this hill here, which doesn't have a name. There's no, that, that hill doesn't appear to have a name. The, the area is called Cullion Estronia, which is the, the, the root of the peak, but the peak itself doesn't actually have a name. There's a very obvious chasm here, which I pointed out for on the satellite image, we'll be talking about this later, but the ring dike basically follows the skyline, goes all the way up here. That's what we're looking at. This is the, the line. It's really, it forms a really obvious line of crags. And if you want to go up to it, the best way is to just go to the end of the trees here. And there's a, there's a rough stalker's path actually goes up the hill, which will follow. That's Loch Ba on a fairly calm, still day. That was actually a few weeks ago I took this picture. The ring dike runs across here on the other side of the water, but we'll, uh, we'll come to that later. So you got the hillside, and that's the ring dike there in the distance, all the way forming that skyline, very distinctive. And you've got these nice little waterfalls cascading over the, the rocks that are outside the ring dike. The rock there is called granophyre. I mentioned granophyre earlier on. It's just a type of granite. And um, it's, it forms these nice slabs. It's, it's a sort of creamy color, quite distinctive. It's very different from the basalt lavas elsewhere. So that's uh, it's, it's, you know, it's quite, a, quite a pleasant approach to the thing. So you go across that and eventually you come to follow the track up the hillside, you come to this thing, which I'm not honestly sure what it is. It's ruins of some sort, whether it was a sheep bank or some sort of shelter or building or whatever, I really don't know. Um, but it's a convenient point to aim for and to start off up onto the dike. So this is the dike running up here. That's it going up there. And you'll notice the, the rocks are sort of light color. It's one of the distinctive features about it. It's, it's a fairly pale coloured rock. And it's, it's because it's, it's that pale colour because of the, the minerals that make it up, which we'll look at in just a minute. And this is what the stuff looks like in close up. And what we're looking at here is one of the really distinctive features of it. The white stuff in the background is the main body of the rock, but it's also these little darker coloured inclusions. And some of these are, you know, they're like swirls that have been described as being like bits of toffee in amongst the rock. So this, you've got this darker material mixed in with the light coloured material. And it's, it's actually from two different sources. The white, the white stuff that is, called, is a rock called felsite, which is a bit like granite, if you like. And these darker stuff, this darker stuff here is more like basalt lavas. So you've got the two right there, so that's some more examples of it that forms these streaks and uh, swirls and lumps in amongst it. Uh, it's a very, very distinctive feature of this, this, this ring dike, certainly at this location. Um, it's this, and it's what, one of the things that it's actually famous for, is this, this mixture of two different rock types. It's an example of what's called mixed magmas. The main part of the Loch Bar ring dike is rhyolitic, in other words, it's similar to a granite, it's granitic in composition. But those inclusions that you see in it are a, more of a basaltic nature. That's basaltic material, twists and swirls. And what you've got here is two different types of molten material, two different magmas that have come together and the mixing has been incomplete. 
it's not it's not one's not it's not as if it's been completely mixed and a uh, approximated to a composition halfway between the two. There um, is incomplete mixing of the magmas. So you might think, well, what's all this about? What do you mean magma and all this sort of stuff? This is where it gets a bit techy. The difference in different types of a uh, lavas, different types of basalts, uh, magmas that you get are determined by the minerals that make them up. So things like granite as quartz, basalt feldspar, diatite mica, stuff like this in it. Things like gabbros are rich in calcium feldspars, pyroxene, and sometimes olivine. So these tend to be dark colored, the rocks on this side of the scale, but on this side, they tend to be light colored. There's a lot more silica in these ones and less in these ones over this side. And it's also because you have temperatures of crystallization, other elements as well. But basically these are two different things. They're quite distinct. And what's happened is this material has been present at the same time as this. And the two have mixed together incompletely to give you what you've got. So the word felsite is this word that keeps cropping up. It's, it's basically just a fine-grained volcanic rock. So it's, it's like that. It's, it's a, just basically a type of very fine-grained granite. Um, and that's what the main part of the Ring Dyke is made of. But as I said, it's got these darker basaltic material in amongst it, which is what we see here. And some of them are quite dramatic. I mean, the contrast in colour is quite, uh, it's quite distinct because these, these granitic rocks tend to be light in colour and the basaltic ones tend to be darker simply because of the minerals that make them up. You know, most of the, the basalt rock that you find around about Mal is a fairly dark colour. Looks a bit like this. Um, if you think of something like the, the Ross of Mal granite, for instance, it's a, it's a sort of light pink colour. So that, that's fairly standard with these things. Granitic rocks are lighter in colour, basaltic ones are darker. The hand lens there gives you some idea of the size of these things, but they, they vary quite a lot. I mean, there's, there's big lumps, there's tiny bits, there's all shapes and sizes. It's also quite columnar in places. It's got this, you'll be familiar with the columnar basalt in places like Staffa. Um, you also get this stuff takes on a columnar appearance in different places. Hey, uh, this is a this 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 picture and that last one were taken at exactly the same grid reference. This is from a uh, Colin McFadgen's input into this SNH guidebook, the little uh, pamphlet that I showed you. And it, that's, like I said, I, I used my uh, phone to get a, a grid reference, and it's exactly the same as where that is, but it looks quite different from that other one, that other picture. But you can see there's a, a definite columnar structure to it. If you go further up the dike, up towards the top of it, which is what we're doing here, you can see the, it, it looks increasingly like a wall of rock, especially on this side. It's, it's quite dramatic. It's, it's, it's a really dramatic landscape feature. Plus it's this very light color. It's, uh, it's, not, you know, it's, not, it's, not, it's not dark color at all. It's a very light colored rock. This is on the top of the dike here. And that's the summit of Benegreik, the hill that is on the back of over there. You can see it down to Loch Nakiel here. So the, uh, the top of Benegreik here, I think that's basaltic. It's a different color. And you've got that type of rock I mentioned earlier called granophyre, which forms this creamy color here. So, you know, the different rocks are all quite distinct in terms of their colors. It's maybe not the bright colors that you see in the geological map, but they're, they're still, you know, readily distinguishable. This is looking down the ring dike. And as I said, it's, it's like a wall of rock, it really stands out. And you can see Loch Ba down there. It's Loch Nakiel over here. And this material here is the, the granophyre, the granitic stuff that's out, out with the, the ring dike. So it's a really distinctive feature. If you go over to, towards Benegreik, like I showed in that previous picture, and you look back at the ring dike, that's what it looks like. Like I said, it's, it's very much like a wall of rock. It really, really stands out. It's, it's, a, it's a very distinct feature of the landscape. <clears throat> and at the top there, again, it's quite columnar. It looks very, you know, it's quite a distinctive appearance to it. One of the things about the Loch Bar Ring Dike is it, it, I mean, it represents the collapse of the volcano. And it's, it's more or less the final major igneous thing that happened in Mull. The, the, collapse, the, the collapse of the, the, the volcano and the, 
intrusion of the ring dike around the edges of it is the last major event. But there are still some dikes cutting across it, some much later dikes that actually cut the ring dike. So these must represent the very, very last igneous activity in Mull. Um, and they, they stand out because they're that sort of brown colour uh, compared to the, the felt side of the ring dike, which is sort of light, light grey, white coloured. So there, there's, there's, there's quite a few of those cutting across it. Here's another one. And again, you can see the light colour of the rock is um, the, the, the ring dikes, this very light colour. And you've got this darker, though it's full of heather, um, uh, later dike cut across it. Uh, and you can see as well that the the ring, this this dike here, cutting the ring dike, is actually softer material because it's eroded out and you've got this a bit of a channel cutting through it. And if you look at this here, I mentioned this here, I've gone back down again. If you look back up the hill, you'll see there's this very, very obvious chasm. This is what it looks like. And this is an eroded out dike. This is one of these late dikes that's been eroded out and it's formed this really steep sided chasm. A really, really distinctive feature. You know, it's, it's, it's unmissable, this thing. You've got the, um, the dike in the bottom. You can actually find the dike rock. It's full of boulders, but you can actually find the dike rock itself in situ. It's like a dollar out or a basalt, which is fairly typical of these things. And, and when I was putting the slide together, I just noticed there's a sheep's horn lying on the side here. Just to add to the interest. So that's the uh, that's 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 the one of the late dikes cutting the ring dike. This is another picture of it from the and it also cuts this rock here. It's you know it isn't the chasm isn't quite so deep here, but it runs down this the edge of this here. So that's that's where it goes. If you look at the that hill that I said it doesn't actually have a name from near the, the shore of Loch Ba, you'll notice there's a lot of really distinct lines going down there, they're all sort of parallel. Now I've never been up there to look at that, but I think these might be dikes as well. I know that there's, there's lots of dikes cutting the, the ring dike. So these are some of these late stage um, tertiary dikes that, that cut across the ring dike. Uh, there's, there's quite a few of them there. I'm pretty certain that's what that is. So it's something to, something to investigate sometime. So that was the southwest side of Loch Bar, where it's really obvious. On the northeast side, it's not quite so obvious. It still forms a line of crags, but it's, it's actually a lot less accessible. It's much more difficult to get to. This is looking across Loch Bar, and um, that's called Strondenbach, that peak there. And that's Nabachan and this one here. And between there and there, that's the ring dike actually running up there. Uh, it doesn't look as dramatic as it does on the, the southwest side that we've just been to. So, um, but that, that's where it goes. It's still, it still forms a line of crags. You know, it's, it's, it does give this standout feature in the landscape. I mentioned that you, you also pick it up in Glen Forsa as well. If we, if we look at the, the map again, the old map from the memoir, We've just been up here, okay, up onto this bit here. And um, that, where that little stream runs, that's where that uh, that big chasm was with the dike cutting through it. That's what's going on there. Um, and this is on the other side of the loch that I just indicated in that picture. Uh, there's a hill up here called Bind the Loose where you can actually see the, the ring dike. It crops out up there quite nicely. And there's also various places in the streams in Glen Forsa where you can uh, look at it as well. Glen Forest has got a track all the way up it, so it's actually quite accessible. It's quite easy to get to. Uh, and then the, the dike goes around here. You'll notice there's, there's a couple of bits where it's just indicated by a, a chain line here. That's, that's where the, the actual dike itself isn't visible, but the line of the fracture, the, the, there's crushing of the rock along the fracture uh, to indicate where the fault line runs. So the, 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 the dike isn't present all the way around, but the, the line that it was intruded along is. So we'll have a look at the, the stuff up on this area here, over in Glenforsa. 
If you look at a bit more detail on the map, this is it here. The ring dike is this orange thing, and you see it going all the way around. Now, I sometimes wonder about some of the detail on this map because, you know, it's a lot of this is interpolated. You know, you, if you were to go up that stream, you'd find it, and this one you'd find it, and various others. But there's, there's sometimes not very much evidence on the ground in between. Um, in most of the, you know, the, the valley, there's it's just grass and tussocks and things. There's not a huge amount to see. So, um, but up on down the loose here, where I've got the arrow, uh, you can see it quite clearly up there. This is the track up Glen Forsa, and that's by Tala in the background. Very distinctive shape. Lovely hill. Um, so you follow the track up until you come to this, uh, this stream cutting a little culvert under there. And you head up the hill. Now, as you're heading up the hill, you look across to the other side. And that is actually the line of the ring dike. The point, the culvert where I started from was there and headed up the hill here. There's an obvious landslip here, which is a fairly standout feature. But the, the ring dike actually runs along there. Now, as I pointed out, there's not actually an awful lot to see in terms of the, you know, rocks sticking out on the hillside. So it's quite subtle. It does take some hunting down. And it was the, it was the geologist James Ritchie who did most of the detective work to actually find it. I'll be talking about him later, but he explored all this and searched all these streams to find it and managed to connect them all up. But we're up on Bind the Loose here. You can see the track quite clearly going up uh, Glen Forsa. And sure enough, once you get to the hill, you start to find the ring dike and it, again, you've got this columnar structure to it. And when you start looking at it in detail, you'll find there's darker patches amongst the light colored rock, like you saw over on the other side. Maybe slightly different on this side, but it's the same basic sort of thing that's happening. You've got these swirls of dark material in amongst the light colored material. And little pieces just all over the place. Uh, you know, it's, it's really obvious when you're on top of the hill. If you just look at the rocks, you can see it quite clearly. So you see, it's, you know, it really, really stands out. And the, and the rock itself, you know, being a granitic type of rock, or, you know, light colored rock is, is quite distinctive. If you, from the top of the hill, when you look down a bit, there's this obvious crag. And this stuff is a rock called Gabro, which is here. And this is the actual ring dike at this point here. This is the actual contact that you're seeing here. It's, I mean, it's not often you actually get to see a really nice clean contact, but that's it running along there. So this is the ring dike here, and this is the rock on the outside. And so that's the line of the fault. That's the line of the fracture. So whatever is on this side has gone down by a considerable distance uh, as a result of the fault of the collapse of the volcano. This bit has actually dropped down quite a bit. If you look at uh, Glen Forsa, again, you've got the these stream sections here where you can actually find the, the ring dike. This is one of them that I found last week. I'm looking for this is it here. It's not, that's, that's a hill called Ben Krekek Vor behind. Um, the ring dike at this point is really, really hard to find. You can find it in the stream. This is it here. So it's, it's not, you know, it's not as spectacular as the stuff we saw earlier. It takes a lot more detective work to actually find it. So these stars show the locations that we've been to. This is up above Loch Bar here. That was down the loose. And that is the upper bit of uh, Glen Forsa. Now the dike continues around here. And from what I've read, I haven't been to it, but there's on the front of Ben Hospital here, there are some good uh, locations. There's one of them this, in this stream here, and it's described in the memoir as a, a capital exposure of the ring dike. So it must be quite a good one. It's, um, it's quite, a, quite an off the beaten track up there. But um, yeah, and it goes all the way around and you can pick it up in different places. So the key points to take away are that it's an excellent example of a ring dike. It's one of the best in the world. Um, 
you've got acidic and basic magmas were present at the same time, basically granitic and basaltic material was uh, available for eruption. And these are mixed when the when the thing did collapse. I've seen that this you know, this 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 is something that um seems to vary depending on what you read. The central block, according to some sources, has dropped about a thousand meters, which is quite a quite a drop. So that must have been quite impressive. I've I've read elsewhere that it's only about 150 meters that has dropped. So I'm not I'm not if anyone can clarify on that, it'd be quite good. Um as I said, you know, that a lot of the re there's a lot of research still to be done on this, I think. It's only been, you know, studied a little bit really. There's not been a it'd be good to give it, you know, the modern treatment and really really uh, really analyze the thing. Um but anyway, the the the, you know, the 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 central block has dropped. You've got an intrusion of the dike into the fracture around the edge. That must have been quite explosive. Um, the the fact that these magmas are, aren't properly mixed, the fact that there there's bits of the black stuff and almost the white stuff, is a, a sign that it was it was incomplete. It wasn't quite the last igneous event in Mull because, as I pointed out, you've got dikes that cut the ring dike. So, um, but it was one of the one of the final episodes. These chaps are two of the guys who were responsible for all this stuff. This is Edward Bailey on the left here, looking rather dapper in his field gear. Um, I think eccentric is probably the word to describe him, but um, he was the the main guy for doing all the research in, in the early part of the twentieth century, and. Uh, did a you know the the Mall memoir is an amazing piece of work. Um, this is James Ritchie. He was he was the one that uh, did most of the work on the ring dike. He's the guy that did all the like I said the detective work, tracking it down, tracing it for its whole a uh, perimeter all the way around. Um, his sartorial style looks slightly more conservative than Bailey's does in this picture. Um, but uh, yeah, these these guys what the, what these guys did at the time. When you think about it, you know, in the early 20th century, you know, the roads would have been, you know, getting about mall would have been a fair effort in those days. They wouldn't have had the facilities, they didn't have the tools, they didn't have the techniques or the, or even the clothing that we've got nowadays. And uh, what these guys did was an amazing piece of work and it needs to be, you know, appreciated. So that is the talk. That's me finished. This is a somewhat bend the loose. Cairn made of Loch Bar Ring Dyke fell site, and that's the view over to the sound of Mull.